Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, before I start, I would just like to say that the, all the slides uh, can be obtained through this QR code. Uh, it will actually take you to a, a, a Twitter link where you can, um, if you want, tweet that you're here and hopefully enjoying the session. But you don't have to tweet it, but the link to the slides are from there. Uh, so please don't, don't feel the need to take photos of uh, the slides throughout the presentation because they will be available online indefinitely after. OK, so we're going to talk about high availability for pets and hypervisors and give you a kind of state of the nation overview of what's happening in, in the OpenStack world. My name is Adam Spires. I'm a software engineer at SUSE specializing in high availability and OpenStack. And this is my colleague, David Dea, uh, from Intel, who has a, a similar area of um, expertise. And today, so we'll very quickly look at where OpenStack is currently in terms of high, high availability. Then we'll uh, look at when we need high availability for the compute node plane, because that is a slightly controversial topic. And we'll look at some of the architectural challenges involved in implementing that. We'll go through several existing solutions, give you some hopefully completely unbiased advice on choosing a solution. and. Um, We'll talk about stuff that's coming in the near future and also how you can get involved with the upstream community. So today, we have um, high availability looks something like this in OpenStack. Uh, it's usually just on the control plane. And you have like active and active services um, for the uh, uh, OpenStack services, API services, for example. Active passive, maybe, for the database and message queue. That can be active passive as well. Um, but the point is that the uh, services get automatically restarted and you get increased uptime uh, uh, in terms of manageability of your cloud. And if you look a bit closer under the covers, typically you'll see um, Pacemaker and Chorusync used as the underlying clustering technology and HA proxy maybe for load balancing. Quite often you'll see Keep Alive D used as well. Uh, this is all very standard st stuff. And it's basically kind of a solved problem, mostly. But it's outside the scope of this talk, really. Um, that's just to set the context uh, for this talk of where we are currently. So that's basically the picture uh, on, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen here, um, that the control plane is highly available. But you still have the challenge that if a compute node fails, um, then, then things can go wrong. So. When is uh, it important to do something about this kind of failure mode? Does it do, do we really need to care about it? Some people say, actually, we don't need to care about it. Um, and for the benefit of any uh, non-native English speakers in the room, you may have not have heard the expression white elephant. But a white elephant is uh, an uncomfortable topic that no one really wants to talk about. So they just leave it in the corner of the room and, and pretend it's not there. Uh, we're not going to do that today. The, the white elephant is whether you should run pets in the cloud or not. And so let's just take a, a quick look at this. So first we need to, uh, I'm assuming probably everyone here has heard of the pets versus cattle metaphor, but I'll just run through it very quickly just in case anyone hasn't. Um, so this is a metaphor for virtual machines in your cloud. And there are kind of essentially two types of virtual machines, uh, which uh, the nature of which are uh, kind of given, the clue, the clue is in the name, really. So. Um, pets are typically given unique names, whereas cattle aren't. Um, this reflects that pets take a lot of work to create and look after, whereas cattle don't. And similarly, when something goes wrong with a pet, you need to invest a lot of effort to fix it, whereas with cattle, you just get another one, and it's simpler. So what does that mean in practice for Compute Node HA? Um, well, when a pet dies, you actually get service downtime because it's not designed to be resilient to failures. Um, with cattle, the, the cattle are designed that if, if one of them fails, then the service still keeps running, albeit in some maybe slightly degraded fashion. And the pets are typically stateful with mission critical data in there, whereas the cattle uh, just have uh, a stateless or they just have disposable data. So you don't need to worry if the, the uh, data storage goes away. But both need some kind of automated recovery. So the pets, because they, they have this critical data 
associated with them. The, you need to make sure that that data is protected if there's a failure. Um, cattle, you don't have to worry about that, but you uh, do still need automated recovery. Well, why do I say that? Well, if a compute node is hosting cattle, um, over time, it, the failures mean that our service becomes more and more degraded, and manually restarting them is a waste of time um, and unreliable due to the human factor involved. So we need some kind of automated way of doing this. And Heat used to actually support this uh, with HA Restarter, um, but that was deprecated in Kilo. And um, I talked to the PTL, current PTL of Heat recently, and apparently there are no plans to bring this kind of functionality back in, although there are new kind of convergence and self-healing uh, capabilities being added to Heat, I believe. I'm not an expert in that area. Um, but you can do restarting through you know, the, the APIs as normal, but you need to do it yourself. So uh, in contrast, it's a bit trickier if you're hosting pets and the pets fail. Apologies to anyone who loves kittens. Um, so in this case, we have to be much more careful to resurrect the, um, when, when, when we're resurrecting the, the pet VMs, because when a compute node fails, we think it's failed, maybe because we've lost net network connectivity to it, but it might still have access to the um, underlying storage, and it might actually still be running and still writing to that storage. So if you resurrect the VMs on, that, um, on another compute node, then you will have like the resurrected pet running on a new compute node, but you also have this kind of zombie evil twin pet running on the unhealthy compute node, and they'll be writing to the same storage, and you get data corruption, and your uh, mission-critical data is, is now in trouble. So this is a big problem, and we really have to deal with this carefully. So in conclusion, our opinion is that, yes, there are really good reasons for doing compute HA. Uh, firstly, because cattle need to be auto-restarted in some way. And secondly, actually, there are really valid reasons for running in pets in OpenStack, even though a lot of people don't like the idea of doing that. Um, you know, the typical response is to say, oh, you should just migrate all your pets into cattle workloads. But in, in the real world, you know, that's a lot of effort, and you can't just do it overnight. So um, it's, it's best to have some solution while you still have pets around, um, especially if you want to consolidate all your workloads into one cloud rather than having you know, one maybe VMware estate for all your pets and then another OpenStack uh, estate for all your, all your cattle. So there are manageability benefits in there. So if this is really needed functionality, why hasn't it been already done? And the answer is that it's actually surprisingly tricky to do in a reliable manner. Um, the first challenge is configurability, that every cloud is different, every cloud operator has different ideas of what, what kind of SLAs they want to uh, offer. And so you might want uh, high availability per availability zone or per project or even per instance. And also, there are some failure cases that are unusual, like if Nova Compute fails, um, the VMs could still be running perfectly happily and still providing your service, but they're, uh, they're not manageable anymore. So in that case, you like do you do you kill that compute node because then you're damaging your service and you didn't really need to. But on the other hand, you've lost manageability, so there is a problem that needs to be addressed. The second challenge is obviously scalability. You know, we want to be able to handle hundreds or even thousands of, of compute nodes. And um, related to that, the clustering software uh, typically is like a full mesh cluster that every node talks to every other node. So you can't just extend your cluster to include all the compute nodes, because then the connections, number of connections between all the different machines is just is, is too much. So for example, Pacemaker and, and Chorusync, the underlying messaging layer, um, doesn't scale above about 32 nodes. So there are some kind of obvious workarounds, but they're not good. So you could, for example, d divide up your uh, compute node clusters into artificial chunks, but that creates problems, or you could try and do high availability actually within your guests. And uh, that's really ugly because then you have to have a cluster stack inside your guest. It's like intrusive and it, you would need a different uh, cluster stack for each distribution version or whatever inside your, inside your workload. So this is all that extra work that we don't want. 
So the scalability issue is actually solved by a fairly new feature of uh, Pacemaker, which is called Pacemaker Remote. And what this is, it's uh, an extension that allows you to run a, a proxy daemon on the compute nodes. And they can then be controlled by the core Pacemaker cluster. And you can run all the, any resources on the compute nodes, and then they're controlled by Pacemaker, monitored, managed in the normal way. But the, the, the full mesh um, connections is still just within the control plane. So this can scale very, very high, um, or very far out, I should say. So the, um, the next and possibly biggest challenge is, is around reliability, because you've got to deal with lots of different failure modes. So for example, your hardware could blow up. And um, what you need to do then to prevent the kind of zombie pet problem that I was describing earlier is you need to fence the compute node. In other words, um, kill it forcibly through an outer band management solution like IPMI. And to make sure that the, the VMs really are dead before you resurrect them somewhere else. Then you resurrect them on a different compute node. Um, the same thing if, for example, you have a kernel um, level or OS level issue of some sort. You just fence and resurrect again. Uh, another failure mode is if libvirt or the hypervisor, one of the hypervisor processes on the compute node fails. Uh, a Nova compute could fail. The control plane could fail, but hopefully we've already taken care of that, as I said at the beginning of the talk. And the, uh, if we have a, a recovery workflow controller of some sort to to do the resurrection of VMs, then that could fail as well if you're really unlucky. So we have to worry about that. And uh, the, the VM, uh, individual VMs could fail. And just the VM could be healthy, but the workload inside the VM could fail. And this last one is actually out of scope for this talk, because that is a completely different problem that is very specific to you know, how you want to do your monitoring inside your VM or whether you even want to do that. Um, so that's, that's kind of the last step of the whole puzzle that we'll, we'll just maybe talk about in a future summit. Uh, well, it's probably being talked about elsewhere here as well. <laughs> so uh, this is a good time to introduce something called Nova Evacuate, which you may have heard of before. And if we have um, a compute node failure, after fencing the node, we need to resurrect the VMs in a way which OpenStack is aware of. And luckily, Nova provides an API for doing this, which is called Nova Evacuate. So we just call that API, and Nova takes care of the rest. And um, if we don't have shared storage, it can still work. It will just simply rebuild the VM from scratch on another compute node. Um, and at this point, I need to give a public health warning that actually Nova Evacuate doesn't really mean evacuation, unfortunately. It's slightly confusing. And the reason I say that is if you think about natural disasters, uh, in the top picture here, we have a hurricane offshore. And you know the, the weather forecasters um, can see it coming, and everyone has advance warning. And so it's not too late to evacuate, whereas in the lower uh, picture, the devastation has unfortunately already occurred. So a typical evacuation is, is too late by that point. And if you translate this to, to Nova, then the, the top scenario is a bit like Nova Live Migration, where you're doing maintenance um, uh, that is planned. And the bottom scenario is unplanned, that there was a, a big failure. And in that case, evacuation is not really the right word to use. Um, so in summary, uh, it's, it's a bit of a misnomer. And in Vancouver, actually, the Nova developers were discussing maybe renaming it to Nova Resurrect or something like that. But it hasn't happened yet, and um, it, it probably won't happen anytime soon. So just whenever you hear Nova evacuate, just pretend you, you saw Nova Resurrect, and it will maybe make more sense. Um, so now we'll talk about some existing solutions in the free open source space. And the first one is uh, one that I've actually been working on quite a bit um, over the last year or so, uh, which is based on um, a thing in Pacemaker called OCF Resource Agents. And a resource agent is essentially a plugin to Pacemaker that lets you uh, manage resources of any type you want. And so what we do is we actually um, we have two resource agents, called one called Nova Compute, which runs on the uh, compute nodes, and that just looks after the Nova Compute service. Um, and we have 
uh, another one running on the control plane called Nova Evacuate, which is in charge of the VM recovery workflow. And that, has, that uses its own database inside Pacemaker. On the left there, the CIB is the cluster information base. And um, there's this helper uh, fence agent called Fence Compute, which will uh, store state in there when it sees a, a compute node has failed, the, uh, the node will be, uh, so the, the, uh, node, the compute node explodes and the, um, it gets fenced, then it marks in the database that the node needs recovery and the uh, Nova Evacuate uh, service initiates the workflow and then calls the Nova Evacuate API to recover. And so in this solution, we have, um, we have the ability to deal with failures of the compute node and the uh, Nova Compute service, the libvirt service, any other part of the software stack on the, on the compute node. But what we can't do is look after the individual VMs. And so this is uh, commercially supported in uh, RHEL OSP, I think, 7 onwards. This is a screenshot from OSP 8 documentation. Uh, showing the beginning of the installation process for this. It's a sequence of um, command line um, commands that you just type, and it will set the whole thing up. And then once you follow that, you're good to go. And it, it's also in the product that I work on, which is SUSE OpenStack Cloud. And I've got this demo video here to show you, if I can start it. So this is the web interface uh, for managing SUSE OpenStack Cloud. And the first step is we'll just start up a pacemaker cluster from scratch. We'll call it cluster one. And there's a bunch of options you can set here. We'll mostly take the default, except we'll set up the fencing. Stonith stands for shoot the other node in the head. We'll give the IP of the hypervisor so that it can um, take down individual nodes. And we'll assign the controller nodes to the cluster, to the pacemaker cluster. And also, we'll install Hawk, which is a web interface um, which allows us to look inside the cluster. We'll see that a little bit later on. And then we assign the compute nodes as remote nodes in the cluster. And we hit apply. And then that will take a few minutes to, to do all kinds of configuration management. Um, and then we come back and we do the setup for Nova, which is just uh, simple as we um, assign the cluster of controller nodes to the Nova controller role. Um, so that's a highly available compute plane. And then we assign the remote nodes to the KVM uh, roles so that the uh, KVM services are made highly available. This is the Hawk web interface. And you can see uh, we have the two compute nodes running here. And then this is the evacuation, the recovery workflow controller. And there's the fencing agent. So that's the setup. Now let's test it out. We have a VM running here, just a Cirrus image. Um, and the first thing we'll do is find out where it's running. Is it running on compute node one or two? Well, you can see it's not on one, and it's on compute node two there. So we'll ping compute node two and just keep an eye on that, because that's the one that we're going to be killing to test the failover mechanism. And we'll also ping the VM that is running on that compute node. And so we just get the network namespace there, and then we copy in the IP address from the uh, horizon. So we're pinging the compute node in the second window, uh, so in the first window, and the VM in the second window. In the third window, we'll just keep a look, an, an eye on the log files to see the Nova Evacuate um, workflow. And now we'll force a failover by killing the Pacemaker remote daemon, which is this, pretty much the same as killing the node. And we can see that Pacemaker has noticed the failure. And the, the pings to the VMs have stopped. They're both dead. And the evacuation workflow has started and completed and then the pings uh, recover. So the, the compute node is actually already rebooted. Obviously, this video is sped up because we don't have much time in the talk. You can see the, um, the compute node has been fenced, uh, as cor which is correct. And the uh, compute node rebooted, but the hypervisor is not up. And now the instance is on the uh, other compute node. And it's yeah pinging. That's the end of the demo. So sorry if that was very quick, but we were trying to cram a lot of information into one talk and couldn't figure out any way to make it uh, slower paced. <laughs> uh, so in summary, this approach using the uh, Pacemaker OCF agents is ready for production use now. There's commercial support from Red Hat and SUSE. 
Um, the code is upstream in the OpenStack Resource Agents repository. Um, which, and by the way, when you visit these slides online, all these things are hyperlinked, so you can just click straight through to the project. Um, and I'm the maintainer of that, so if you have any ideas or, um, uh, for, for improving it or whatever, then just please get in touch. The downsides are that there are some corner cases. Um, they're actually really small corner cases where failures um, can be problematic. And it doesn't, like I said earlier, it doesn't handle failures of, um, of, of VMs. But it, it's a pretty good solution. Um, but we're, we're going to do better in the future. So uh, the next one is Masakari, which has a really similar architectural concept. Um, and it looks like this. So the recovery workflow engine is the Masakari controller in this case, which runs outside Pacemaker, um, unlike the last approach. It's got its own database. Um, and it also has these uh, extra monitoring processes on each no compute node. Uh, so there's a, a monitoring process to monitor the hosts, one for the processes on the compute node, so like Nova Compute, Libvirt, Silometer Agent, and so on. And there's one also for monitoring individual uh, VMs, failures of, of VMs, which is a nice extra feature. So this is slightly better in terms of which failures it can handle. It can handle the failure of the compute node in its entirety on the left. Uh, on the far right, it, as before, it can handle the, the failure of Nova Compute or Libvirt. Um, but it can also handle, you see in the middle there, VM2 uh, failing. And um, that's a nice extra feature. So that's also available on GitHub. Um, there's a recent 1.0 release, uh, which added support for Pacemaker Remote, so it now scales. Uh, there was CentOS support added. It uses SQL Alchemy now, which is nice. Uh, one caveat is that if you're trying it on Ubuntu 14.04, then to uh, Pacemaker Remote, because it's quite a new feature, and the, the version of a Pacemaker on Ubuntu 14.04 is pretty old, so you will definitely need to build um, uh, compile, compile it yourself. Probably not the case on 16.04. I'm not sure. Um, so in summary for Masakari, uh, the nice things are that it monitors the VM health externally, not inside the VM. Remember I said that's out of scope. Uh, and the, there are a few other things about the recovery workflows that are quite nice and a bit more sophisticated. On the downside, it really only uses Pacemaker as a glorified um, host monitor. And there are some disadvantages associated with that. For example, it has to wait five minutes after the node has been fenced, um, which is not great. So now I'm going to hand over to, uh, to David, who's going to talk a bit about the uh, Mistral-based solution that he's been working on. Thanks, Adam. It's working. Cool. Mm. OK, uh, so first of all, uh, I'm not sure if you are all familiar with Mistral, so I'm going to uh, talk you a little bit what Mistral is. So as you probably Red is a workflow as a service service for OpenStack. Uh, it enables users to create a workflow, which is uh, just a graph, logical graph of task. Each task, uh, you can define what to do for each task if it happened with success or if it ends with error state. Uh, if the tasks that are already in Mistral are not enough for you, you can write your own uh, actions. These actions are literally a Python classes, so you can do anything inside it. And this execution workflow, it may be triggered by, uh, based on events from Silometer. You can use it as a type of cloud cron, so run the workflows on a, a given time. Or you can use an API call to uh, run it on demand, which is used in the solution. So this is this uh, architectural diagram that you have seen before. And Mistral also fits into it. We have Mistral as a workflow controller. We have Mistral database, and we have also this small fence evacuate script that is uh, run when the node is fenced. So uh, it can handle the, uh, compu the, uh, the compute uh, node failure and also Nova and Libvirt. In case of compute uh, failure, it is fenced, as in the OCF agent uh, solution. And then fence uh, evacuate script is called, which is just telling Mistral to launch the evacuate uh, workflow that will be shown later on. And then as a result, Mistral is communicating with Nova API and telling Nova to evacuate the VMs. Uh, for the Nova Compute, Libvirt failure and other, it also uses a pacemaker remote feature. So it's exactly the same solution as the OCF agent. 
So the code is uh, available on GitHub for the solution, and uh, it has a lot of uh, pros. Like uh, you don't add, you use the components that are already in OpenStack. You don't add it some new components. Uh, it's very simple, like you will see. Uh, and it potentially can be integrated with Congress, which will enable us to uh, do a different workload depending on the type of failure that will happen. Also, it has an ability to tag only some VMs for evacuation. Of course, there are some uh, cons, like it's experimental code. And also Mistral Resilience is work in progress. We do a huge progress on Mistral HA during the Mitaka cycle. There is still some work to do during the Newton cycle. So this is how the evacuate workflow looks like. Uh, it's listing VMs uh, at the beginning. If it succeeded, it filtered the VMs so that we know which we want to evacuate, which not. And if that succeeded, we send the evacuate uh, up with an evacuate API call to Nova. If some of this failure, we can retry. Of course, it will not be retrying forever. We can define how many times we would like to retry before we fail the whole workflow. Uh, what is uh, worth adding to it, if we are uh, sure that this workflow will be run after the node was fenced, we should uh, add at the beginning Nova mark host down call so that Nova would know that this host is already down and it will be speeding up the whole process. And also, we have ability to mark the VM suspects. We can do it uh, two way. One way is to use the metadata for a VM so that we are setting that this particular very important VM needs to be evacuated. Another way is to just mark a flavor using the, uh, using the uh, extra specs for flavor. And here is a demo, how it works right now. So first of all, we are launching some, two, we are launching two VMs on the same host and we are attaching floating IP to them so that we can attach, uh, we can uh, SSH or ping them. We are uh, pinging uh, the first one and we are uh, SSHing to the another one. And after that, uh, I will create their uh, file so that you will see that with a shared storage, which is used in the setup, we'll get the same file after evacuation. So uh, we will re literally got the same VM after a hard restart. So there I'm creating some, some text file and checking if it's already there. There it is. Uh, and now I'm starting to ping this VM also so that we can see when we lost the connectivity with it and when we will get it back. And very important part, we want this one VM we are just created a very important file to be av high available, so we're marking using the metadata it so that it needs to be evacuated. Okay. Uh, we are just checking if this happens and we can see in metadata it's evacuate set to true. And uh, one part, we are looking to logs to see what will happen when we kill the compute node. So we're just looking into the uh, log of pacemaker to see what will happen. Everything is set, so we can SSH over to a compute node and kill it. And after a while, there will be uh, logs in pacemaker that will show that this compute is fenced and shows up. So that means that the uh, fencing process has successfully and we can see that the VM is now up and running again. We can try to SSH over it and there is our file. Okay, uh, so the, another approach is using Senlin. Senlin is a clustering service for OpenStack. Uh, it is designed to orchestrate uh, the collection of similar objects like Nova instances or like hit stacks. It has a lot of policies that enables you to, uh, for example, placement or load balancing for scaling also. 
and uh, during the Newton cycle, the Selin team is going to work hardly on a health policy so that it will enable you to just keep eye on your cluster of VMs and automatically bring them back to life if something wrong happened to them, but it is not done yet, so right now it's, it's only promising, so you should keep eye on this project, but right now it's not usable. Okay, so uh, this is a quick summary, uh, well, maybe not quick, but <laughs> summary of um, the three the three first three solutions we talked about. Um, again, I would strongly recommend that you, you know, go and look at these slides online and take longer to digest them because there's not enough time to go through all the details here. But the, the highlights here, uh, at least for me, or I think for us, uh, are the, uh, we're quite excited about the possibility of integrating the Mistral approach with Congress to do policy-based recovery. Um, and also the, there are these two capabilities of Masakari, which are very nice and which we feel a best of breed solution in the future should definitely um, include. Uh, uh, in general, actually, these three solutions are really quite similar. So, um, you know, they, they, they do the main job pretty well. So there are other considerations um, other than just functionality uh, worth thinking about. Um, a couple of proprietary solutions. One is ZeroStack, who actually have a booth here. It's near the SUSE booth, so please come and visit us and them in, in one visit if you want. Um, they presented um, in, in Tokyo, and it's basically a cloud in a box that you install in your data center. Um, they provide a software as a service management portal remotely, so you need a, a port 443 connection between your cloud and their management solution, but that's it. It's quite, I think, simple to set up. Um, they have uh, VMHA coming as a feature, I think, I believe quite soon. I'm not exactly sure when, but in the next release, I'm told. Um, so that's definitely worth keeping an eye on. And it has some other very interesting features in there, this kind of adaptive approach where uh, a node can magically turn from being into a compute node into a controller node, for example, if a controller fails and you want to keep quorum in the cluster, you might want to boost it back from a, being a four node cluster back to a five by sealing a, a compute node, which is pretty clever. Um, there's another solution that was uh, presented in Tokyo as well, very different, doesn't use pacemaker, uses other um, technologies, um, has fencing through IPMI and self-fencing. And um, it, one of the really nice things about this one is that it has this kind of action matrix approach uh, for dealing with the different failure modes in different ways, and that can be configurable. Unfortunately, the source code's not available, so it's, it's not um, usable uh, outside these companies at the moment, but who knows, that may change in the future. So which one should you pick? And here's where we give a highly unbiased decision tree, and I actually genuinely believe we tried very hard, even though obviously we have vendor allegiances and so on, tried very hard to just stick to the facts. And, and the facts are these, that um, if you want a, a validated stack that's already been very you know, well tested and supported, um, then you have um, options depending on whether it, it matters to you that it, you want it to be uh, open source and uh, upstream or not. Uh, if, if, you, if that does matter to you, then you saw the, the Red Hat and SUSE solutions um, earlier. If you're not too bothered about uh, using proprietary stuff, then uh, I've been told by Canonical that they have um, partners that they can work with that provide proprietary solutions to it, and sometime soon, Zero Stack will also be able to offer it. Um, if you want to uh, do it yourself, basically, then, um, then you've got these options, which I, I would just say, you know, rather than recommending one, I would just say evaluate them, to be fair, have a look at all of them, and make your own mind up. Um, Personally, I think we believe that the Mistral approach in the long run has the most promise, maybe, but certainly Masakari has some nice features I mentioned. Um, and also the OCF resource agents approach is possibly the easiest to deploy right now, maybe, but it really, I think, depends on your individual case. But I would say don't underestimate the work involved in doing this yourself, it, like, because I know I've you know, in, in building the, the, the uh, SUSE OpenStack cloud version of the solution, that was a lot of hard work. So uh, if it was hard work for us, then it's, it would probably be some hard work for you too.
And if, if none of those sound good, then just wait for the community to come up with something better, which we'll be working on. And that brings me nicely on to future work. Um, so obviously, there's going to be a lot of interesting discussion this week. The product working group really care about this feature, which I find pretty significant. And we want to build a best of breed solution, uh, possibly based on Mistral, maybe you know, with elements of Masakari in there somehow. Um, and there are, there's other work to be done, design work and so on. It's all going on. If you want to get involved, please do. Um, firstly, we have a lunch meetup tomorrow, 12.30. Uh, just look for a table with the Cluster Labs sign, um, or just look for the guy with the shaved head. It might be easier. Um, and you can join us on IRC. I set up this um, OpenStack HA IRC channel, I think around the Tokyo time, maybe just before Tokyo. Um, uh, there's also an official label HA, that badge. Um, so if you want to talk about high availability on the OpenStack dev mailing list, then please use that label um, so that people can filter for those emails and spot them easily, because it's a very high traffic list. We have weekly meetings, IRC meetings, um, which are logged. If you can't make it, you can look at the logs afterwards. The link is there. Um, and as I said before, my OpenStack resource agents uh, project, well, I shouldn't say it's mine because I inherited it from somebody else, but I'm maintaining it now. <laughs> um, and there's the HA guide, uh, which is under active development. And yeah, so please get involved and you know, tell us what you think. Um, so now we have about four minutes, miraculously, for questions. Uh, so please use the microphones, um, or I can repeat your question if you can't get to one. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you very much for reusing an existing HA solution and not writing your own again. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> the Mistral um, approach looked like it migrated the disk image. Is that correct? And do Mistral and uh, OCF also migrate disk images for the VMs? Uh, you mean if it's uh, if migrated what? Because I didn't <laughs> hear it clearly. Sorry. <laughs> The VM disk image, since it still had that same file on it. Uh, no, because when the if the node goes down, there is like no way to go to it. So if you don't have some kind of uh, distributed storage like Ceph, then the disk is lost at that point. So to use this solution, you need to use some distributed storage. Any other questions? If not, of course. Oh, OK. Yeah. Can you show the QR code again? Oh, sure. <laughs> Great idea. Yeah. Um, um, do, oh, uh, do I have a home key? <laughs> it's a new laptop. Thank you. <laughs> so what's the timeline for the mistrial, like realistic timeline, as far as being? You mentioned Red Hat was production ready and Suza as well. But what's the? Uh, um. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, from my perspective, Suze is very interested in, in this solution, but it's, it, it won't, like, we've just released Suze OpenStack Cloud 6, so it certainly won't be here until uh, version 7, which I guess will be a while. And there's a few things we have to figure out, but I mean, I think the, the work that David has, has done so far has, has proven that it, it, it has, you know, it really works. It's a good sound approach. and. Uh, has a lot of potential, so it's difficult to say right now. Hi, uh, can you please comment on the latency of failure detection as well as the scale at which it has been tested? Right, um, well, it, it depends on uh, what thing's failing and how you're monitoring things. So, but typically, um, so for example, if the, um, if the compute node fails and you're using Pacemaker Remote, then it depends on the monitoring interval that you've set for Pacemaker Remote um, from the core control plane. And in our product, I think we have that set to 10 seconds. Um, I'm pretty sure that's right from memory. So it, it, it happens pretty quick. And, and one of the things that we do to, we didn't really mention, to increase the, the response time is that once Pacemaker has noticed that the compute node has failed, it then tells Nova forcibly, okay, you know, it uses this special API mark host down, 
um, to, to say to Nova, hey, you haven't noticed yet, but this host really is down, so you need to consider it down, and that means we can start the recovery process instantly. So that, that saves a good, I think, 60, 70 seconds. Uh, so it's a pretty important thing to use. But if you were to reduce the latency, do you have uh, scaling issues? I mean, like a number of computes and so on. Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, I'm told, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't claim to be a pacemaker uh, remote expert, but I'm told I work closely you know, with a lot of people who are, and, and they say it can, can scale up to large numbers, and I, I don't believe there would be any significant latency. I mean, it's low traffic, the monitoring, so um, yeah. Don't, I, the, I guess the honest answer is I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I don't think it, it's a big problem. Okay, I think we should probably uh, uh, say wrap, wrap it up and let the next speaker. Uh, so thanks very much.